Welcome to part two of 20 Advanced 2D Shader Effects. In the previous video, we introduced the Sprite Custom Lit Shader, where we can sample light textures to manipulate the scene lighting. We also looked at sampling the camera sorting layer texture and started with simply changing the colors on all the rendered sprites. Let's continue from there because there's lots more we can do with the camera sorting layer texture. We can warp and distort the camera sorting layer texture for a variety of effects. Let's start with glass. This shader should be a sprite lit shader. All these textures are included in the package at the link below. Start with the basic setup of sampling the camera sorting layer texture and create parameters for the main text, mask text, normal map, and an optional special additional map we'll use called warp map. And then create a parameter called glass warp we'll use to adjust the refraction effect. Sample the secondary textures, the alpha of the main text, the normal map, and the mask text, and connect them all to the fragment inputs. On the normal map sample texture, set the type to normal. Then put the glass object on the CSLT effects layer. Set up your main texture sprite with the secondary textures. And then drag the main texture sprite into the sprite renderer. Before we can start in on the warp, create another light. You could even just duplicate the existing one. Call this light Mask Light 2D and set the blend style to multiply with Mask R. I also want to put this only on the CSLT effects layer since we might boost it a lot to get the glass looking shiny. Then let's bring up the intensity to get glare on the glass. You can have the normal maps enabled on the light, or you could disable the normal maps, which gives a little more of a stylized look. Really quick, let me show you the shader for the mask texture in Blender. This will still be useful to look at, even if you are just painting the mask. Small addition here to the technique in the secondary textures video. This time we use a Fresnel with a color ramp to have the mask strongly around the sides. And then we want some red mask in the middle of the object to have something like a glare that emphasizes the shape. The lighting is head on, and then we can adjust the glare with a roughness if we want it more stylized. The warp can be approached a couple ways. The simplest way is to just use the normal map, multiply it with a strength, and then add it to the screen position. We're multiplying the glass warp strength with a small number to have more reasonable control in the inspector. If you want more control over the warp effect, you can make a special height map for the warp. And that's what this warp map is about. With this approach, we use the grayscale values of a texture into a normal from height node, which can be added to the screen position like before. This texture is just a render of the Z or blue channel of the normal map shader with some modification in the mapping. And then it's rendered and saved at a 16-bit color depth. Warping with a texture can lead to artifacts, but if we use a 16-bit grayscale image, there are a lot more grayscale values. That increases the file size, but we actually don't need a large texture as much as all the grayscale values. So the texture can be a small size and thus a small file size. This gives some more refraction around the lip and edges, which adds some nice detail. Let's pop a flower in here, change the background, and see how it looks. All right, we're really excited to see what you do with this. If you have glass, you'll probably want some kind of liquid inside of it, so let's do that next. If you want to add water, just duplicate your warp map group, only add another strength parameter called water warp, and then use a rectangle with an offset to mask in the water warp. Use the same mask to overlay some color. Let's quickly walk through three more effects that use the camera sorting layer texture. First up, a magnifying glass. The distortion works similarly to the vase. The warping in this is coming from a smooth step gradient from the center of the UV that is subtractively masking out the center of an ellipse shape. We have a couple parameters for the size or sharpness of the distortion edge and the kind of magnifying distortion we want, either concave or convex. Our zooming or magnification is done through adjusting the tiling. The tricky thing is that we need to calculate the offset to have the zoom match up to where the object is on the screen. You can do that in a script, but it's kind of nice to handle it completely in the shader. So I'll show you this subgraph here, 
pause if you want to keep copying this screen. Okay, so here's the subgraph with the offset calculations for x and y. Okay, so here's our zoom parameter. Let's try it when it's somewhere else on the screen, maybe up here on this dot. And yeah, there we go. Things are zooming where they're supposed to. Let's take a look at the heat haze effect in the Dragon Crashers project. This example is cool because it uses a line renderer instead of the sprite renderer, so maybe this could also be used for engine exhaust or some kind of laser or spell. This is an unlit shader, and let's start at the end of the graph. The refraction has movement by animating the offset of a gradient noise, and this scrolling noise is simply multiplied with the screen position, and then we have a lerp for how much of the refraction we want. That goes straight into the UV of the camera sorting layer texture sampling. All right, so the group here tells us what's happening. The vertex color gives us the line render color, and we can combine that with the camera sorting layer texture. I hope that the previous examples have made this much easier to follow. Then we combine the smoke detail with the camera texture. And as we've done a little bit before, we have the smoke texture providing the alpha, though we want the vertex color too to have alpha control with the line renderer. The smoke texture we're embedding in the graph this time, and the rest is just the scrolling of the smoke texture. The scrolling parameters here are different to have separate control over the smoke and the refraction. Let's look at one more camera sorting layer texture effect from our new Gem Hunter Match 3 project. In Match 3, there's a ripple effect when a match is completed. Let's check out how this kind of warp is made and then make a little variation on the shape so you can come up with your own thing. The ripple starts out with a sphere shape created with the red channel of a polar coordinates node. The X of the polar coordinates node is the distance value from the center point. So it's similar to what we did with the magnifying glass with centering the UV and using the length node, but this way it gives better values in terms of a radial gradient with radius values going from 0 to 1. Now, what I have here in this group is just a simple way to debug or visualize the values coming from the nodes. It's useful when you're figuring out effects or coming up with new ones. So from this smooth step, it looks like we have values going from 1 to 0. And the smooth step node doesn't output values beyond that range. But otherwise, whether something is below 0 or above 1 is hard to know in the preview. Therefore, we can connect up to this and see that the values are less than 1 and greater than 0. Let's see if there's anything less than 2 but greater than 1. And there isn't, which makes sense. So our values are between 1 and 0. What if we, in effect, subtract 1 from this? There's nothing above 1. And then we start letting values through. That's pretty much what we're doing up here. We have a time node that we can multiply with a speed, and a fraction node, which is a cool way of getting just the values between second counts, 0 to less than 1. The shape, then, is being subtracted 1, and then it's being subtracted less and less. Imagine it like water, shutting a valve closed and then slowly opening it all the way again. Then this is multiplied by 10. From the output of this clamp, let's look at the values greater than 2 but less than 3. Okay, so we're seeing rings of 2 to 3 moving outward. If we do 2 to 4, we're getting more of a cross-section of this expanding sphere. So with this clamp, these values seem oddly specific, don't they? The sine node takes in an angle value in radians and then computes the sine, which will be a value from negative 1 to 1, oscillating. What we're doing here is clamping the values to a sine period of the peak at 1, down to negative 1, and then 1 again. So a full period. It can be easier to read to use the constant nodes with the pi value than doing just the raw number. Sine is 1 at a 90 degree or pi over 2 radians angle, the first number in the clamp. And then the next time it's at 1 is at 450 degrees, one full 360 revolution plus another 90 degrees. So 5 times 90 degrees, 4 all the way around and 1 more, and in radians that's 5 pi over 2. Let's change the multiply to 1 here to look at this, and let's look at a sine wave graphed out. So from 90 degrees to 450 degrees, only in radians, that gives us a full period. Once we have things clamped to one period, 
we can multiply this to get two periods. So in this case, I'll have it here given how the transforms in this equation are set up. With two, we have two periods or two ripples. And then same holds for three. Three periods, three ripples. From here, the sine node goes into a normal from height node. Then we can use the fraction node flipped to fade out our effect because we're multiplying by 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 which is reducing our normal warp values to zero, and then 0.9 again. The strength of the normal from height node is divided by the width of the camera, and this keeps the effect consistent across varying camera sizes. And then all of this is added to the screen position for the UVs of the camera sorting layer texture sampling, as we've done before. If you want to try working with this to create a different effect, swap out the radial gradient for a different shape. For example, you can use a twirl node to make a whirlpool or a portal. Or you could use linear gradients like these to do something like regular waves from above, or whatever this cylindrical effect is. A variation in the included samples is a modification for creating raindrops by using the shader in VFX Graph. The shader is a variation of the radial warp called Raindrops VFX. If you want to use the warp effect for explosions, the most important change to learn from this example is that the time node is replaced with a parameter. The parameter for this effect is called propagation. And then in VFX graph, the age over lifetime is connected to propagation so that the VFX graph particle lifetime can drive the shader. That gives us VFX timing control over the effect. And also here we have randomization of the multiplication parameter before the sine wave that we were playing with before. This way, there's a variation of how many ripple rings there are. Let's switch back to what we started with, the Sprite Custom Lit Shader, because there's some other effects we can create with the lighting textures for both practical and creative applications. We can use the Sprite Custom Lit Shader as a substitute for scene lighting. And this is really useful when there's a bunch of objects that need per-object lighting. In this case, in the Gem Hunter Match 3 project, we're controlling the lighting on each puzzle piece without needing to have 100 2D spotlights. Essentially, the light position data is moved to the shader. That keeps the scene neat, adjustments are easy to work with and change, and without a bunch of lights, the performance is better. Since we're using the shader for lighting, we can do some cool effects to all the puzzle pieces at once. In this case, we have a rotating glare on each of the gems. To create this, we sample the normal map, gathering the information about the direction of each pixel. And then we use the dot product node to apply simulated lighting to each pixel. This means we don't have all of these light objects zooming around the scene. Dot product compares two vectors and tells us how alike they are. With unit vectors at a length of one, if the vectors are facing the same direction, the dot product is one. You know that game of hot and cold where you help someone find something? Imagine there's a perfect step someone could take to a secret you're trying to help them find. And if they step in that direction, they're hot. If their step is in the opposite direction, you'd say they're getting colder. And if they step to the side, they aren't hot or cold. It's the same thing with the hot product. I I'm sorry, I mean the dot product. If the light direction, the direction to the light we mean, not the direction of the light, if the direction to the light and the direction of the normal of the pixel have a dot product of 1, that pixel is facing the light and lit head on. And if the pixel is pointed in the other direction, it's in shadow. The dot product is negative 1. Having negative values will affect our lighting in a way we don't want down the line, so we use a saturate node here to clamp the negative values to 0. Let's go on from here. The vertex color will give us the color tint we set in the sprite renderer. And in this case, it allows us to do shader-based multiply lighting, which will later combine with the light textures from the scene. The smoothness value adjusts the size of the glare. Greater means a smaller, sharper glare, which gives the effect of surface smoothness. The exponential we're doing here is 2 to the power of the input. And I think the best way to understand this kind of stuff is to bypass nodes and see what they do. Like, without this exponential, the glare is much more unfocused and spread across the sprite. All of this is added to the original sprite color and sent to the base color. Let's look at the rest. In this example, we have a nice base sprite subgraph to collect the sprite and secondary textures together. Then, since this is a custom lit node, we're multiplying in the light texture 0 for the first blending mode, the multiply lighting. 
And we're using the mask map with Light Text 3, which is the last blending style, the additive with mask red channel light blending. This base sprite lighting is then assembled before we add in the highlight effect. The light direction is being changed by an animation on a game object. Though I suppose you could do that in the shader itself. It's hard to know how to work with something just looking at one example, so let's do something different with the dot product node. Let's say we want to have lighting or glare follow some kind of target. Working with a C theme, it'd be cool to do a harder level where the only lighting comes from deep sea creatures, like an anglerfish. Rather than use the light direction, let's instead get the direction to a target, the anglerfish. Gem Hunter uses a script called Light Manager on a Light Rotator object to set the light direction on the global material for the tiles. Keeping things simple and just using this script, instead we're sending the anglerfish's position to a target position parameter. Well, it's actually the position of luminescent lure right here. In the shader, rather than get the light direction, we get the normalized direction to that target position from each position of the tiles and run that into the dot product. Not sure what kind of gameplay would go with this, but sometimes as a tech artist, your job is to show possibilities like this to your team. Now, one note here is that when there's shadows on your art, it can be a bit tricky to deal with. In this case, we need to mask out the shadows so that the light glare effect isn't added to them. This is what it looks like without the shadow mask that I have here. You may want to be consistent in the color or alpha value of your shadows to make it easy to mask them out if you need to. And then, one little note, we're using the glare as a mask for the color of the angler's lure. And now for the second to last effect, and the purpose of this one is to show how to make easy lighting adjustments using the light textures. Fog has a scattering effect on light, and we can simulate this in a lit sprite material. This fog uses two noises, and they're being offset at different speeds to create subtle, undulating movement. The fog movement parameter is fog slowness rather than speed. We're actually dividing the time, which gives some finer control. The fog is just simple noise at a small size with a couple of smooth step nodes, which we can refine in the inspector. You can get slightly different effects depending on the blend mode here. Linear dodge gives a volumetric quality to the noise blending, but screen gives a smoother, more uniform look. For the shader, it's good to have control both over how much lighting affects the fog and how opaque the fog is. In this case, we can use the vertex color node to control the opacity and color of the fog in the sprite renderer. The benefit of using the sprite custom lit shader here is we can have more control over the effect independent of the light settings. In this case, let's say we like the global light setting on our environment, but it boosts the fog too much outside of the spot lighting. We can use the lighting texture as a mask in a blend node, say, such that everything that falls outside of a certain lighting range can be adjusted. With this out of light adjust slider parameter, we can bring the fog down outside of the lighting so that it's affected less by the global light and is thus spookier. And speaking of spookier, we have one more sprite custom lit effect. Not sure what to call this, it's like a light shimmer or a projector type effect. This effect comes from taking the heat haze refraction effect from Dragon Crashers and pasting the scrolling noise into a custom lit shader. Rather than connecting it up to the camera sorting layer texture, here it's connected up to the light texture UV. We have scrolling UV noise over time, the noise UV and scaling, some smooth step shaping, and then blending it with the screen position UV with a lerp for how much of the effect we want. Then there's just a little bit of extra control to boost the lighting, and we're sampling the main sprite texture. Then in the scene and each corner around the skull, there are different colored spotlights. Pretty cool effect. All right, that's it for this video. We hope you found some useful stuff here. Congratulations making it all the way to the end. Take care.